but thank you for joining us for another episode of Sultana Sessions. My name is John Mann and I'm joined by my colleague, Brad Hirsch. And Hi, we are coming to you from the Hope Education Center in Chestertown. Um, we are in different sections of this building, uh, still social distancing, um, but we are excited to be able to bring you in virtually and show you the first contact room which is the room that I'm sitting in, which is uh, probably the newest addition to this space. Um, before I get too deep into the weeds, a little bit of housekeeping. The Sultana Gala is coming back live. So if you would like some information on that, I'm gonna put in the uh, web address right now, which is really easy to remember because it's sultanagala.org. Um, and so you can check out all that information and we hope to be able to uh, have a fantastic night with so many of our friends live and in person once again. Um, so I'm the director of the Lawrence Wetlands Preserve. Brad, what do you do for Sultana? Uh, so uh, I am in non-COVID times, the director for paddling programs for kayaking and canoeing um, at Sultana Education Foundation. And actually during pandemic times too, we're also doing uh, quite a few uh, outdoor socially distant programs uh, well, on kayaks and canoes. Great, and um, we the, the room that I'm in, our first contact room, Brad and I use this frequently along with other staff members um, to do these virtual field trips with different school groups. And it really lined up well with a lot of their um, curriculums earlier in the school year because they usually start off their history classes learning about the Native Americans who lived in this region. So thank you for joining us. Um, if you have questions or comments as we go along, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll do our best to respond. And for, for just a bit, I'm gonna say bye to Brad and I'm gonna take you on a tour of this room. Um, so this is, if you're familiar with the Holt Education Center, I'm on the second floor of the brick building, the older historic building. Um, you can see that we've retained a lot of the uh, really beautiful features of this building with these wooden beams and the brickwork um, because this was originally a church. So when it was first built, there was no second floor. You would uh, come in and have these beautiful cathedral ceilings. So uh, I'm, I'm very happy that they left that, uh, that view open. And um, so what we've done is we've put up a permanent display as you go around this room of uh, the Native Americans. We're using a lot of these paintings that you're gonna see were all done by a gentleman named John White in 1585. Uh, he toured the, um, the coastal Carolina region, so what we would call the Outer Banks. And he did a series of watercolor paintings of what he was seeing, uh, the lifestyle of the people who were living here. And I'm just going around kind of um, quickly right now, but I promise we'll, we'll get into each one of these scenes a bit more in detail. Um, I also should put in a plug for our website, which I showed you on our last episode, sultanaclassroom.org, um, because there's a whole section all about Captain John Smith and the Native Americans. So if we touch on a topic and uh, you don't get all the information you want, you can probably go to that website and dig a little bit deeper. And of course, we also have links to other organizations, um, printouts that you can use at home, which are... Um, particularly great for homeschool groups. So please check that out um, if you get a chance. So when we talk about the Native Americans in the Chesapeake, these are people who came here at least 14,000 years ago, okay? Um, I say at least because we don't know a ton about these earliest people. Uh, we know that they were most likely they formed roaming bands of um, hunters um, but most of their village sites, the places where they would have lived 14,000 years ago, are now underwater, okay? Because uh, the planet was undergoing a warming cycle, right? We were coming out of an ice age. So human beings, as we know, uh, tend to live close to coastal areas, close to the water um, for a number of reasons, but it just, it helps with survival. Um, we obviously need water to drink or for our crops. Um, water was the way they traveled, water was your highway. Um, so we've always wanted to be close to the water and those places that were once close to the water um, have now been flooded. As, uh, as, the, I, as we came out of an ice age, um, what was the, the Chesapeake Bay is basically a flooded river valley of the Susquehanna River. So um, any 
artifacts, things that those people would have left behind. Some of them have been found, but it's extremely difficult because it requires underwater archaeology. Um, we do know that by the time Europeans came here, so we usually talk about Jamestown. Um, by the time Jamestown Fort was settled, the Native Americans who were living here had been here for millennia. Um, they had already established complex cultures, civilizations. They had trade routes. Um, they had religions, political systems, um, and they developed excellent techniques for hunting, fishing, and farming. Um, and so Brad and I are gonna spend the next 30, 35 minutes talking to you about a lot of those techniques that they developed um, because they used the resources at hand. So the Native Americans of the Chesapeake, different than if we think of the, the tribes out West, um, these people were sedentary, okay? They were not nomadic. Um, so a lot of times when you talk about Native American housing, teepees spring to mind. Um, but as you can see in the scene behind me here, uh, these people lived in wigwams, okay? Because everything they needed was already here. They weren't following the herds of buffalo, right? Um, they were subsisting off of things right out of the river, right out of the bay, um, and growing crops right on the land. So they set up these permanent structures. Uh, what they were were uh, bent saplings uh, fastened together, and then the outside was covered in uh, either bark or straw mats or sometimes even animal hides. Um, and so this scene also is kind of interesting because it's a palisaded village. So the whole thing is surrounded by a spiked wall, right? It's almost like the Native American version of a, a castle with a, a moat, right? Um, so why were they doing that? For safety, right? Um, these people didn't always get along with one another. Sometimes they were going to war with each other. So uh, what this did was there was only one way in and one way out. So if, if you were tasked with defending this village, you create a pinch point, a bottleneck for any invaders. It's much easier to defend rather than people coming at you from every angle. Um, you can also see the layout. All the, uh, the houses are all around the outsides and there's one large communal fire, one gathering point in the middle. Uh, these were people who relied on each other, right? Everyone had a role in a tribe and it was important that we could all count on each other to fulfill our roles because that ensured the whole group would survive. Uh, and then one other kind of fun detail about this painting, you can see there's a, there's a dog, right? Domesticated dog living with the people. Again, probably for security, you've got a watchdog. So while you're sleeping, um, you know, there's something that can alert you if, if there's trouble coming. Okay, I see uh, our first question. Thanks for, thanks for, so is the shipping channel the same location as the original river? Yes, that's a great question, Jim. Um, that, the, the reason there's a narrow shipping channel in the bay and then there's so many shallow areas is because like Jim surmised, um, that was the original Susquehanna River. And then as it flooded out, uh, we've got lots of places in the bay where it might only be two, three feet deep um, because that was once the river valley. So I'm gonna send, uh, send it to Brad here and he's gonna show you, we've got in this building a collection of authentic artifacts from these people as well as uh, reproduced objects because some things you're just not gonna find uh, in pristine condition. Um, so we like to give students an opportunity to get these things in their hands. And I hope um, before long, anyone who's watching this will get an opportunity to come into this building and check these things out for yourself. So take it away, Brad. Uh, yeah, so what you, the, one of the things that if you're really looking at the, um, at those, uh, the, the village that John was showing you is that you're gonna see there's a lot of wood in there, okay? And when we think about the ways that we're gonna work with wood today, uh, one of those interesting things is we'd have an ax, a chainsaw, something along those lines. Well, they didn't have the same kind of metallurgy that we have today, uh, but, they did have their own ingenious way of working with, uh, of creating axes and other kinds of things. So when you look at this, this is one of the replicas that John was mentioning. You can kind of see 
that it so you can see the handle here and then you can see uh you can see kind of the blade here and actually you know it, it kept they were able to keep like a little bit of a uh of an edge there and there are some interesting parts so this is the way that you would have had like an axe okay and you can see a few different things the first thing that you want to see about this is that over here it's more narrow than it is over here and that's by design okay and so Basically, like kind of one of the ingenious aspects of this is that as you were using this, so the um, the hole that the uh, that the axe head went into actually was like carved so it became more narrow. And so with this, they're using basically friction. So each time you hit it um, and use it, you're actually jamming it in there further. Okay. Um, a few other things to note about this. Okay. Uh, is that you can see the burn marks here, okay? You can see burn marks on this side as well in a few other places. And so, they, uh, so they're using fire to work with wood consistently. So you would have tools that you would do that with, and you would also be using fire to work with that for, uh, for a tool like this that you would be using to kind of like work with wood, to kind of like think about uh, like creating different things, like say a dugout canoe, which I'll kind of jump on in a second. The uh, and so we not so that was a replica, but we do have some axe heads from here, and you can kind of see that you'll have uh, you can that the this is dated to be about a, a couple hundred years old, probably like around 500, and you can kind of see that they this would not have been constructed the same way that we had that replica axe because this is more like, it almost looks like a fish. And you can kind of see that they had worked this down and they would have like used, uh, they would have used the uh, like reeds and uh, entrails actually dried out to kind of tie this to a piece of wood for this, okay? And so you can kind of see that it's been worked and it's kind of, and it even, you can see it keeps an edge over hundreds of years. So that's a pretty cool, uh, like tool that actually was found in this area, okay? Um, and so you kind of get to the next stage and uh, like that they might've used for an ax, but also, so this tool looks similar, has like the same obsidian rock that, uh, that the ax head had, but looks a little different and uses another, uh, and uses like another um, resource. So you have the wood, you have the obsidian, and then, you have the deer entrails in here and sinew, okay? Uh, and so they're through a process of like smoking and like hardening and using that, you can see that they attach this to the top and this tool also keeps an edge, but this would have been used to say, dig out a canoe something along those lines. So you would basically start a fire, create some coals, and then you could use this to kind of like dig out a little bit, okay? Now, as you're starting to think about this, you're like, okay, well, these edges probably aren't good enough to work with the resource of the deer sinew here, okay? And so as we think about that, uh, as we would think about that, we have another tool here that you can kind of see here. And you can see this as a, now this is another replica tool, okay? Uh, and you can see that over time that this was like worn down and worked over time to create an edge. And so this, we had someone that basically created all of our replica tools for us uh, and, uh, and sent them to us and uh, they created this for us and it took time and it took work. And so as you're thinking about each of these, okay? The, um, what would happen is that like, uh, like a tribes person would be working on this over an entire day. They might work on this Jasper and they would kind of like work it down or they might work on the obsidian over there. Uh, and so over time, over a couple of days, like that would kind of be like the thing that you were working on and you're constantly working on creating these ax heads, constantly creating these uh, arrow heads, constantly creating all of that stuff and just kind of putting them to the side so that you could use them when you needed them, okay? Uh, and also something that I would like want to point out about like going back to the ax heads. This was not natural to this area yet or 
the, um, this kind of stone, yet we found this kind of stone here. And what that really speaks to is that there was a flourishing like trade with, say, the mountain tribes and the tribes down here. So they had resources down here, uh, like furs, uh, like swamp fur, or uh, animals that came in there, and rock. And so that this is kind of evidence of the con uh, of like the interaction between uh, between these tribes in different areas. Um, and so with that kind of you can get an you can get an image or a thought of how they created that John the the village in that John White image. So with that, uh, I'm going to hand back to John. Thanks, Brad. So um, let me take a look at another uh, village scene done by John White. And uh, this is the village of Sikaton. Apologize for my light. Oh, there we go. Um, and here you can see these people weren't living in fear of being raided, right? We see that their, their houses are much more spread out. We don't see that giant fence surrounding the whole area. Um, and we can also see there's some agriculture going on, right? There's there's a cornfield in different stages of growth. Um, so I wanted to use that to kind of jump into how they were feeding themselves, how they were subsisting, all right? And when we think of it, uh, it was really through agriculture, through gathering, or through hunting and fishing, okay? And just like all over the Eastern shore today, you're gonna find cornfields. Uh, the Native Americans understood that that was a, a plant, that was a crop that would really thrive in this area. Um, so what I have here is what you might hear referred to as Indian corn, but basically what we're trying to show is that it wasn't just one standard type of corn, right? If you were a tribe on one village, you might be growing a certain um, strain of the plant, whereas your neighbors on the other side of the river might be growing something slightly different. Um, but besides just being able to grow corn, you can store it, right? That was another big challenge for people before electricity and refrigeration um, keeping your food, right? It's one thing to grow it uh, when everything's coming in, but you need food to help you subsist through the winter when you're not gonna be growing anything. Uh, and we know that corn can be dried, right? Uh, and just like we see corn stored in silos today, they would, th this is a bowl we made out of a gourd, um, but they would have these big containers, um, maybe something like this, maybe a big clay pot uh, where they could hold those things to help them um, get through at times of the year when food wasn't so plentiful. And how about gathering? Gathering's one of my favorite because uh, it requires a real skill, right? When you walk out into nature, and if you're a proficient gatherer, right? Um, you're kind of, it's like you're walking down your supermarket aisles, right? You're making a mental note of this plant is here and this grows at this time of year, and the acorns are gonna drop at this time of year, uh, and you're, you're super efficient, uh, and the best thing about gathering is you don't have to do all the work that the farmer has to do, right? We know that that's a, that's a tremendous um, amount of effort. Not that gathering's easy, but at least the plants are growing on their own. So I have two examples here. Um, we've got some walnuts. Um, we've got some acorns. Okay, And just like in the early fall, you see squirrels gathering those things up, burying them underground. Um, this was a food source. Now you want to boil these, right? I think there's a toxin in them if you just tried to crunch into these fresh, but um, this is a food source that's going to store. It's like in its own little container uh, and it's not going to be the most exciting thing to eat throughout the winter, but it's going to give us enough calories to survive. Um, the One of the observations John Smith made of the Native Americans was how much their bodies changed throughout the year, right? When food was plentiful, they packed on the weight. Uh, times like the winter, they were almost starving, right? Getting very thin until um, right now when when food would, again, the fish are returning to the rivers uh, and things are easier to find. Now, how about hunting? And uh, if you're bringing in a lot of meat, how do we store that? Well, a lot of times they would, uh, and fishing too, they would smoke the game, right? So they would cut them into thin strips. So what I've got here is uh, some smoked venison uh, or deer meat, uh, and it's almost like making a jerky out of it. Uh, so they would cut it into thin strips and they might have a wigwam that was dedicated to smoking, almost like a smoke shack. And they'd hang those strips uh, and they'd have a nice 
fire that they'd be adding greens to because you want to produce as much smoke. And what the smoke does is it kind of seals it and preserves it. Um, and just like, you know, you can go into a convenience store and beef jerky doesn't need to be refrigerated. Same thing with this venison jerky. Um, and then I've got another object here that we found uh, in a local farm field. And this is a mortar and pestle, okay? Uh, this is a small version. You could also do something similar with like a big branch and a stump. Um, but a lot of this food, they might grind up. So uh, this corn, and no Kent Cultural Alliance, I'm not gonna eat any of this, all right? Uh, good question, but so many educator and children's hands have been over these food through the years, so <laughs> I would not risk it. Um, but if you were preparing this to eat, you might put some corn grains in there and grind it up. And look at this, this little depression is just from years, uh, you know, these things like fit together perfectly. Uh, they're a matching pair, which my colleague Chris Serino found these and you can imagine his excitement. Um, how do you find things like this? Well, if you're friendly with a farmer, you can ask for permission to walk their fields, uh, especially after things have been turned over. But basically you're looking for things that have been unearthed. Right, you're not you're not going out on archaeological digs and digging your own plots. Look for things that are naturally eroding, like a bank on the side of a river. Um, and there's, in addition to John White's paintings, things like this are our best evidence of the people who lived here, because unfortunately they weren't writing their own history. Um, so a lot of what we know about them, we have to interpret from found objects, or we have to rely on outside observations. And of course, people can get it wrong, right? Europeans can misinterpret uh, what they're viewing in another culture. Um, and so when we were designing this room, uh, we made sure to talk to a lot of the indigenous people in this area today. Uh, and that's something I'll definitely come back to before we finish tonight, that we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about the first contact, but we don't wanna think of Native Americans as a culture that only existed in the past. Okay, so um, let me, let me uh, take you over here if we talk about hunting. Actually, we're live, folks. We can change things on the fly. Um, let me talk to you first about how they would make implements for hunting. So uh, there's, we think of arrowheads and spear points, right? So these um, stone points, uh, that if this, this would probably be a spear or a knife that I'm holding here just based on the size of it. Um, so. What, what I'm looking for, if I'm looking for a rock that I wanna know, was this, is this just a triangular rock or was this an arrowhead? Um, there's a few telltale signs on this one. Uh, you can see the rough chunks taken out of it, the flakes, right? So this was built using a process called flint napping. Uh, you can also see that the center of it is a little raised, okay? I don't know if, it might be a little too subtle to pick up on my camera, but there's a spine right in the middle, and I'll talk to you about um, how they were, how that was part of the construction process. So you start with raw material. Uh, in this case, I have a big chunk of Jasper, right? So this would be mined, and like Brad said, they were trading things, right? So um, maybe you're a village who's trading a lot of this raw material. And then I'm gonna use another stone, and I'm not actually gonna strike this because I wanna keep this nice, but if I was doing this, I'd probably have a thick piece of leather to protect my hand. I'd wanna wear goggles because shards might fly off. Um, but basically I'm just gonna do some percussion, percussive hits here, right? I'm just gonna bang down on it and knock off chunks to make this a bit closer to what I'm looking for. Um, and so I might fashion it into something like this. And again, here you can see really dramatically the spine and they're just striking down in different directions turn it over, do the same thing. And as you keep doing that, eventually these edges get razor sharp. Okay, so what else could I use? I could use a bone that's conveniently shaped like a hammer for more of those percussive strikes, right? Um, and I'm just working it down. Now I might use part of an antler. Again, just knocking off, you know, finer tools as the work that we're doing needs to be more and more exact. Right, because uh, there's a good chance I mess up, right? It just breaks in a way I don't like it. And then I chuck it aside and I start over. So this, you can also find worked pieces, pieces that weren't finished, but someone was working on them. 
Uh, and then eventually we're going to get down to uh, pressure flaking. So rather than rather than bashing on it, I'm just putting the tip of this antler and I'm pressing down to knock off pieces. And you can see this one was pretty close. Uh, and then this blade, this Jasper blade, is almost the same as what Brad was showing you in that knife blade. Um, so I'll bring Brad up too. So we'll go for the two shot. There we go. Uh, and th this was all made again for us by this. Uh, he's a really cool guy who lives in the mountains of North Carolina and Chris tracked him down. He was really hard to get in touch with because as you can imagine, he doesn't spend a lot of time on the internet, but he made us all these great objects that um, really help bring alive the cultures of the people that we're talking about. Okay, so let me move to uh, to this painting, which is one of the most striking, I think, that John White made. Um, so he, he called this the manner of their attire when they go to their hunts or their solemn feasts, all right? So there's a lot going on with this gentleman. Uh, we can see he's, he's decorated, right? He's got body paint. Uh, I always like to tell students, uh, I can't really interpret the the importance of that symbolism. Uh, I can see that there's red. And I think, you know, if you're going hunting, we, we naturally are going to make a connection between red and blood. Um, we see lots of circles. Um, that's a pattern that is repeated a lot in uh, in a lot of their artwork. We can see he's got some feathers in his hair, not so much for camouflage. This looks more decorative. Uh, his hair style. This was pretty common with a lot of archers. Um, they would keep it really shaved close on one side. He's got like a mohawk and then it's kind of pulled back um, into a bun. And, and, and the reason for that is as you're firing an arrow, you don't want loose hair just blowing in the wind, getting caught in that bowstring. Uh, and so sometimes they would even be as specific as if I'm right-handed, I only shave the right side. Um, and then he's wearing, some sort of uh, animal, probably a deer hide, right? Um, and there's like, there's this interesting tail hanging behind. Well, I've heard some debate on, some people think that's an animal tail that he just kind of like had hung around his midsection. Some people think it might be his hair uh, coming all the way down, which is entirely possible. And then the size of his bow, right? It's taller than he is. So that's going to be capable of firing a great distance. Uh, and then you can see more protection. He's got heavy leather strap right on his wrist that holds the bow. Because again, that bowstring is coming with tremendous force. He wants to protect himself. Um, and then next to this, we have a display of, I think I've been told there's 300 points in this case. Uh, again, these were all found by our colleague, Chris Serino, uh, over... 25 years probably. Uh, this is a, a great hobby and passion of his uh, to go walking on these beaches at low tides and look for things that have been exposed. Um, and we tend to just kind of generically refer to these as arrowheads. In reality, probably only the ones on the outer edge, the ones that are the smallest are actually arrowheads. Um, if you tie something like this to a stick, it's not gonna fly very far. It could be a spear, it could be a knife, um, but probably not an arrowhead. Uh, and so we had this same gentleman make us a bow and arrow because these natural materials aren't going to last for hundreds of years, right? This is, this is wood and the bowstring is sinew, just like Brad was showing you on the ads. Um, so this is natural material. It's going to break down over time. Uh, so, but he made us one kind of in the same fashion. I'm not going to dry fire it because I've been yelled at for that. That's not good for a bow. It puts a tremendous amount of force on the, uh, on the handle itself, and it could actually cause it to snap. Um, if you were truly firing it, all that force would be transferred into the arrow. The arrow I love because it's such a great combination of natural resources, right? We talked a lot about the arrowhead itself. Um, but then, so, so we're using stone. We're using sinew. They would almost make like a glue. This is a bit graphic, but they would boil hooves from those animals um, to make like a glue. The shaft itself, you can probably see this. Uh, it's a reed, right? A hollow reed, like you'd see growing along the side of a marsh. Uh, and then we've got some wild turkey feathers and then a notch for your bowstring. And the turkey feathers, 
what they would do, you could see they're kind of set in there in a spiral. Because when you fire this, in order for it to go straight, it needs to spiral. If it flutters, it could go anywhere. Um, so we've got stone, animal, plant, bird, all coming together um, to make what was an incredibly efficient hunting tool. The, the bow and arrow was much more recent innovation than the spear, right? And if you think about the advantage of it, a spear, I might only have one or two that I can carry. Um, the gentleman in the painting had a quiver filled with arrows. And also this is gonna fire way further than I could throw a spear. So it allows you to hunt your game from a much greater distance. Um, the feathers, good question, Anita. Uh, are the feathers tied on? They're not tied on there. Um, well, I guess there is a bit of um, a bit of that sinew there, but it's all, they're using a lot of that uh, natural glue as well. Um, but this, we've never fired these, but this would absolutely be functional. Um, and the, uh, they're, they're quiet. And the Native Americans would often go out, if you think of hunting today, it's probably one or two at most people in the woods being as stealthy as possible. Um, back then they would take hundreds of people into the woods. Sometimes they would set fires to drive the animals maybe towards a river where they'd had hunters in canoes waiting because uh, they weren't out there for the sport of it, right? This was about sustenance. So the more meat they could bring down, um, the better it was for their tribe. And as we mentioned earlier, they had ways to preserve the meat. So they could afford to bring in more than they were gonna eat uh, in just one go around. Okay, so let's, we've got some examples of um, different types of animals uh, that, that were in this area that the Native Americans would be using. So I think I'll send it to Brad and um, he's gonna show us some examples we kind of split it up that he's going to show some that might have been living in the marshy areas and then we'll come back to me and i'll show you some that would be more in the in the forested areas okay so when we want to think about this like just like we think about ecos different kinds of ecosystems today uh like we're gonna uh, like thinking about marsh swampy areas um, you know, you're not, and also the way that you're going to like get the protein or the animals from say the marsh or the swamp, uh, because it's water is going to be different than you would, uh, with in the woodland areas. Um, and so you might be trapping in those areas and you can kind of see a few. So I have some furs here that would, uh, that would all, that would bring meat that you would be trapping. So the first kind of fur that you would be seeing for this uh, is a beaver pelt, okay? And one of the things that, and uh, keep in mind, you wanna see a few things about this. First off, it's super, it's super thick compared to some of the furs that John is gonna show you in a little bit from like the woodland animals. Uh, and it also is super soft. So this would have been a prized fur. So when we're thinking about trading for different, uh, for different resources from different areas, this would have been like a very, uh, very important thing that would have been bartered, uh, that would have been like essentially kind of currency. Uh, it would have been soft, it would have been very warm, um, and it would have uh, insulated whether you were going to use that as clothing or whether you might use it to insulate uh, a shelter of some sort. So you can see that this beaver would have been something that would have been super valuable, uh, like kind of thinking a few hundred years down the line, uh, trappers uh, uh, like in the 19th century also valued this quite a bit. Uh, and then another animal uh, that would work with the beavers uh, would been otter. Okay, and you can kind of see the uh, see that going through there. Uh, used in similar ways, you might trap in those areas. You would have found a lot of like different kinds of otter, uh, kind of like in similar areas to where the beaver uh, the beavers were. Um, and then, so that's kind of like the mammals. Uh, that we would use, but those weren't the only things that were harvested from the swamps or harvested from those areas. You can see another example of a turtle, okay? And you can kind of see that this, so turtles would have been used for food, 
Um, but also, in addition to that, they could have been used uh, for, you can turn certain kinds of turtles, they can be used as bowls uh, once they've been used. But also sometimes they might, this might be a part of a baby rattle as well. And you'd look at this and you're like, what? How's that gonna work? But the way that you would think about that is that you might use some of the wood and you would tie that onto here and then think about some of the uh, leather uh, that you would have gotten from some of the animals that John is going to talk about, the woodland animals, uh, to create kind of a hide. You might put some stones in there. And so you combine, again, just like with the, um, just like with the arrow or the spear, you might combine multiple resources to create a really cool tool. And this could allow you to allow us to kind of see that toys uh, for children were also a part of the society and the culture of the Native Americans that lived in this area. And this turtle from this swamp would have been one of those animals. Um, and so with that, I'm going to throw back to John. All right. Thanks, Brad. So um, let me show you some of those woodland animals we've been referring to. Uh, I'll start. It's almost turkey season. So we've got our wild turkey here. Uh, if you remember that pattern was the same as on the end of my arrow. Um, what would they use these for besides fletching on your arrows? Um, this, this could be decorative. Um, it could be, uh, it, it's soft, right? So it could be bedding. All right. And then I've got, I've got a deer hide. I'll get, come back to that. We've got squirrel. We've got possum, a skunk, a red fox, rabbit, raccoon, and then another deer hide, All right? I wanna go into more detail about those two deer hide because I think that's, it's kind of interesting to look at the differences. Um, so some of those um, points that I showed you could be knives for scraping. So after you hunt it, um, if you're trying to harvest other parts of the animal, you want to clean it. So they'd, they'd use that scraping knife to scrape it off. This one's been really worked too. It's, uh, it's soft. Um, and this is probably gonna be like my gentleman, the archer, right? This is like your, your warm, your summer clothing, right? I don't want a big heavy fur, but this is gonna be something that's gonna protect my skin. Uh, but also this could be just like we use leather in many different ways. If I'm going out gathering, right i can put all these acorns in here and it becomes like a backpack right a little knapsack that can carry way more than i could carry on my own now to survive the winter i'm going to want something this is a white-tailed deer so i'm going to want something like this and the way i'm actually going to wear this we think of fur coats with the fur being on the outside okay? but they actually would want the fur right up against their skin right to keep them warm and then this kind of rougher part of it is going to be somewhat uh, weatherproof, right? It's going to help keep out the rain and uh, the snow and, and what else is coming through there. So John Smith described the Chesapeake Bay as basically being heaven on earth. Um, and the, the native people who were living here, just they had an abundance of resources and they were uh, skilled and clever at how to use them in ways that help them thrive. Um, so I'm gonna send it back to Brad and he's gonna show us some ways that they would, uh, uh, maybe a surprising way that they would use things from the shelled animals. Yeah, so uh, we've kind of, so we talked a little bit about woodland animals. We talked about marshland and swampland animals. Uh, and all of these, you know, and on the Eastern shore, all of these various kinds of ecosystems and the animals and have, and, and that inhabited these areas, they all provided resources. And so when we think about those resources, the, I want to show you, uh, so you can think about one that we think about today, which is, you can see an oyster. It's a little bit of a glare coming off of there, but you can see like, you know, this is like t a typical sized oyster that we would have. And one of the cool things about this oyster uh, is that if you, go, if you knew where like, uh, where an oyster colony was, you could like just wait out, pick up an oyster, slurp it up, and you had some protein. You didn't have to go hunt it like you did, uh, like you would have a deer. 
you didn't have to even trap it and like like worry did i get the did the trap get the beaver did it get what i needed it was just there waiting for you and some easy protein for that now we also have another cool artifact that is actually a an fossilized oyster and i uh you can kind of see look there are three fossilized oysters that are bigger than the size of my hand just for context um that show this uh, like over the history of the chesapeake bay how big they used to be we can kind of compare that to our modern day oysters and how big like historically they could get um, and the amount of protein that they could provide for and sustenance for the humans that had been living in this area for thousands of years. And so this was a quick and easy way to get protein that wouldn't require you to expend that much ener energy because there's always this little bit of a balance between how much energy are you expending to get the calories coming back in. Um, and you need to think about that. So thinking about the shells, uh, that was one that would have been more in this area, but there are also uh, shells that would have been kind of closer to the mouth of the bay a little bit. And they led to something very interesting, which is a part of the larger bartering economy in like the greater mid-Atlantic area. And so you can kind of see here, some clam, a clam shell, and you see this really rare purple that is really gorgeous to us today and also was considered valuable and rare uh, during uh, like hundreds of years ago for the natives that were here. And they would use that to create kind of uh, like their own version of currency. And you can see this with wampum here, okay? And it could be used as like decorative clothing, but it could also be used in a very similar way to uh, to um, the uh, to uh, to money, okay? And so what you want to see here, you can kind of see how they would have chiseled it out and you can see the purple that they would have used to create this, okay? And then you can also see that they would take out the white there to make this distinctive. And I want you to kind of imagine for a second that this is not a resource that you're going to find even in the nearby Appalachian Mountains, okay? And so if there was something by the, that, the sh uh, that the native tribes in, near the shore would have wanted, like say, we get back to this, so the rock that was here, okay? Uh, it might have been uh, like a bartering item and the wampum would have kind of been a middleman or something along those lines that they could have used to barter and to create to get resources into this area that wouldn't naturally appear in this area if there was like a habitat that uh, and a resource that was there. So as we kind of like think about like this whole area as like kind of a larger um, interdependent economic structure. Uh, uh, hundreds of years ago for different resources. Uh, like similar, we have a similar thing today. Like there are different resources from different areas. We might have a more, we think of it as a more complex inter interaction, but it's still kind of in that similar way. So with that, I'm gonna throw back to John. Thanks, Brad. Uh, and thanks to those who have been uh, sticking with us Brad, it's it's dangerous when you get Brad and I together because we <laughs> yes. both like to talk, and so sometimes uh, we can go on tangents. So our thirty-five minute lesson I see is now at forty-five minutes, but we're coming to the end, I promise you. And there's some good stuff still ahead. Um, so uh, another thing that can be found when you're walking on these beaches looking for things uh, like arrowheads, you might not find that, but you might find something like this. Okay, and this is a pottery shard, um, and what I've found these, I'm not very good at finding arrowheads. In fact, I've never found one, but I have found pottery shards. And what makes them jump out to me is you can see it's a mixture of clay with oyster shells. Okay, so in addition to when Brad was showing us the oyster shells, it being a food resource, they could grind them up and mix them into the clay and it's gonna make the whole thing stronger. Uh, this piece in particular, I've never found one quite this nice, but I love this because it's got some artistic flair to it, right? We can see a design etched into the side. Uh, John White was impressed with these pots. He actually made a painting of one of them. Uh, if we think of these big 
communal fires, right? Cooking meals for maybe hundreds of people at a time. You'd see all sorts of like, there's some corn and probably different vegetables, maybe a cabbage, right? There's all sorts of um, like your, your vegetable stew. And what's unique about this clay pot too, is if you look at the base, it comes down into a point, right? Um, I don't know about you all, but none of my cookware at home is shaped quite like that. But this was made almost like a, a screw top, right? So it would burrow down into the coals of the fire uh, and that's what would hold it in place. And then this would be something that would probably just be basically slow cooking all day long. Um, we wanted to see that. So we reached out to a, a woman who um, was able to take our pottery shards and use this painting as reference and kind of extrapolate how large this thing would be. Uh, and she made us what we affectionately refer to as potzilla. Um, because, I mean, this thing's like the size of my torso, right? Uh, and it's, she used um, oyster shells, right? Along with the clay, she gave it her own little artistic flair there. It comes down into that point. Uh, and it's, I mean, imagine <laughs> how many people we could feed with one clay pot like that. Are we ever gonna find an intact clay pot? I don't think so. Um, just because I'm always terrified being close to this thing that I'm gonna break it. So now imagine asking it to survive for hundreds of years out in the natural elements. Um, but you can find those pottery shards. <laughs> good, good comment there. Friendship farm and pottery, Potzilla. Uh, and so we're coming to the end of our program uh, I, I did mention that um, I, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't talk about Native Americans today. Um, and that was when we reached out to our local tribes to say, what do you want us to tell people about your culture? The number one thing that we heard from all of them was tell them that we're still here, right? We're not just something that you learn about in fifth grade history class. We are still here. Um, you might not always notice us, um, but we still exist here. So I want to actually share, um, here we go. I want to share a, a link of, so here's our website, Sultana Classroom. And if you come down, we, we've got all the, some of these top, a lot of these topics Brad and I touched on, some of them we didn't get to. But if you come down to indigenous people today, um, and we'll bring that up, I would encourage you take some time to go to this because down at the bottom where we have additional links, we've got links to all the websites of recognized modern tribes in Maryland and Virginia. Um, so really it's important when you wanna understand the culture to talk to the people from that culture. Um, so you can go to these different links and see what they say about themselves in their own words. Uh, so I think that's a worth, worthwhile pursuit. And we can see that Native Americans today Sometimes they dress just like us, right? Because they are modern people living modern lives. And sometimes they have these really amazing powwows where they put on their traditional clothing. Uh, and hopefully we'll be returning to a time in, in the near future where that's something that we can attend. Um, and and they, that's one of their ways to, to keep their culture and their traditions alive. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you so much for joining us um, on another Sultana session. Uh, we'll be back again here in two weeks. Um, and if you know someone who didn't get a chance to watch this live, we will archive it on our YouTube channel. So thank you so much. And we're going to sign off. Wish you a good night. Have a good evening.